Hello, everyone. We'll go ahead and get started here. Thank you for joining today's webinar on Go Anywhere 5.7. We know some of you joining today are familiar with Go Anywhere already, and others are brand new. So we're excited to share how Go Anywhere can help you secure, automate, and centralize your file transfers. And then we're going to walk through a few of the exciting new features we've just released this week. Before we get started, I wanted to let you know the event is scheduled for an hour. We are recording this event, so if you'd like to rewatch any portions of it and share it with a friend, you can absolutely do so. And we will send out a link to the recording as well as the slide deck after the webinar is done. If you do have any questions throughout the webinar, you can submit those through the Q&A pane, which is in the bottom right hand of your screen. We have a couple team members on the line uh, who will get to those throughout. And then if you'd like to stay on the line, we will have a, a live Q&A time at the very end of the event. And lastly, once this webinar wraps up, we will have a quick survey that will show in your browser. Please do fill that out. It gives us helpful feedback on what was helpful to you and helps us know what to do better next time. With that, let's take a look at our agenda for today. All righty here. So uh, today's agenda includes a quick company overview of who Help Systems is and a little background on us. And we'll talk through file transfer challenges that you may be facing in your environment. Uh, we'll talk through what is Go Anywhere MFT. We'll give you a, a product overview. Um, and then we'll go straight into a, an overview of our core competencies and a live demo of those. And then lastly, we'll talk about our new feature Cloud Connectors, released in our 5.7 version this week, uh, and do a live demo for you on that. And then we will wrap up with, uh, like I said, a live Q&A session at the end. So let me introduce you to today's presenter. Dan Freeman uh, is a senior solutions consultant at Health Systems for the Go Anywhere product line. Dan has spent the last 10 years of his career in various security roles, ranging from systems engineer to security officer. As a CISSP, Dan has designed network systems and procedures to ensure regulatory compliance using the NIST risk management framework and HIPAA standards. Dan, thanks for being with us today, and I will turn it over to you from here. All right, thanks, Brooke. Can you guys hear me okay? We can hear you loud and clear. Awesome. All right, and thanks to all who took the time out to join us to learn just a little bit about some of the challenges we face with the transfer and manipulation of data, how to keep it secure, and then we'll talk a little bit about what managed file transfer is and how it can alleviate some of these pain points. But first, a quick question to get us in the right frame of mind today. What do you call a bear with no teeth? A gummy bear. All right, I think we're ready to get this thing rolling. Let's get started here. Okay, but first, let's take a moment, share a little background on our company. Now, Help Systems has been around in business for over 35 years and focuses on developing cybersecurity, automation, and operations management solutions. We have over 550 employees and 20 offices around the world to serve our customers. Now, the customer headquarters is in Eden Prairie, Minnesota, but most of the Go Anywhere R&D, support, and sales staff is located right outside Omaha, Nebraska. Our R&D team is constantly improving Go Anywhere, which is primarily based on valued feedback from our user base. There are two or three major releases of Go Anywhere per year, which demonstrates our active development schedule and feel free to visit the, or view the release notes on our website. We believe in providing the best possible service to our customers 24 seven support, 365 days a year. In fact, I think it shows with the almost 99% of our customers stay on product maintenance for Go Anywhere, which is definitely a testament to the excellent service and value that we do provide. Now, as a member of the PCI Security Council, we also are able to keep up to date with the latest standards and ensure our customers can use our products to maintain compliance. The NOMA does have partnerships with major operating systems providers, including IBM, Microsoft, and Red Hat, allowing us to gain access to the latest releases and technical resources for testing and support. The great thing about Go Anywhere Solutions is that it is truly multi-platform. For instance, you can start out by running it on Windows or an IBM, IBM I platform today, but if your needs change, the flexibility is there for you to transfer the license to another server like Linux. Now here's just a sampling of some of our customers. As you can see, we have customers in a wide, wide range of industries. Almost any size company for going to our use, 
for smaller IT shops up to Fortune 500. And you can kind of think of us as a Swiss Army knife of functional software. Okay, so let's talk about some of the file challenges. Some, some of the things that we as an organization may be facing with your file transfers. Now, a lot of IT departments are using older technology and a variety of legacy tools to transmit files. Many companies do not have good error alerts and when transfers happen to fail. Now, some have to wait for their trading partners to call to indicate that they didn't even receive the file. Now, to add to these challenges, many end users are still sending files through unsecured email or cloud services like Dropbox without any controls or centralized management. Now, your organization may still be using PC-based tools to transfer files. And since this is often a manual process, it is most definitely prone to human error and great risk. What if the user downloads or uploads the wrong file? Or what if the file contains sensitive data and the user forgot to encrypt it before transmission? And who's going to run the transfer when the primary user is gone for the day? Or the hit by the proverbial bus, as we all like to say. With many file transfer tools, there are often no logs of where the files were sent. This is becoming a real issue with auditors since many organizations cannot tell them what sensitive files are leaving the network. Because of all these vulnerabilities, it has become very difficult to meet strict compliance requirements using traditional file transfer tools and manual processes. Now, in order to automate file transfers, many companies have built FTP scripts on their systems. However, these scripts can have many downfalls. For instance, FTP scripts can only be written by programmers, which can be an expensive resource. Every time something changes for that trading partner, such as a new IP address or password or file name, a programmer has to get involved to make those changes. And these costs can really add up over time and distract from other priority projects. A big problem with scripts also is that your trading partner's passwords are often stored in the clear, which can make those servers very vulnerable to attack. And many scripts are very basic in nature. We're not programmed to have advanced file transfer capabilities like auto retries, alerting for failures, audit trails, which is why a lot of organizations have been looking for alternatives to this approach. Now, what exactly is managed file transfer? We can think of this as also known as just MFT. It's definitely a solution that allows organizations to control and secure their file transfers through a centralized framework. MFT covers all aspects of file transfer within your enterprise and with your trading partners, including batch transfers between systems, as well as ad hoc file transfers between individuals. Now, Managed File Transfer provides the automation you need for your file transfers, protecting that data with strong encryption while providing the audit trails you need for compliance with strict regulations. Now, with GoAnywhere, we believe that this is the best enterprise-level MFT solution in the marketplace. Now, here is a diagram that gives a quick top-down view of its capabilities. I understand it's kind of a busy slide. We'll kind of go through this. Point being is, this can be installed on most any operating system, as mentioned before, and all administration can be performed right through the web browser interface. GoAnywhere can act as both the server side of things as well as reach out to other servers and services as the client. For the inbound connections, we have listeners such as AS2, FTP, FTPS, SFTP, as well as an HTTPS web client hosting some cool ad hoc ways for partners to easily transfer files securely, as well as a couple other proprietary protocols like GoFast File Acceleration and client server agents that you can install on remote machines and locations to do some fi local file manipulation all while being managed at the central GoAnywhere level. What's really cool about GoAnywhere is what we can do when we get the files dropped off or how we move and manipulate those files to send to our trading partners and, and customers. This is where our workflow automation comes in. Now, a lot of the things that we can do, workflow automation we're going to talk about, it's what we relate to projects. In and in a very high level and almost belittling um, comparison, think of those as like your homegrown scripts. Although projects, as you'll see here in a little bit, are very easily to design as well as have unlimited and very flexible options to do. Things like you can encrypt, PGP encrypt, decrypt, as well as sign and verify a lot of the compression tasks, or any kind of data translation. Maybe you're getting a CSV file that needs to be converted to Excel, or maybe you're dipping into a database to do a SQL statement, pull out all that information and write that to an Excel file. Lots of different things that we can do from there. And that bo bottom lower hand portion there of that slide, there's about six different, just a sampling size of what we call resources. And we'll cover this more when we jump in. 
But resources are go anywhere's way of acting as the client side of things. This is where we're dipping into other servers and services so that we can expand the functionality of go anywhere. Uh, again, think of go anywhere inherently in its name, managed file transfer, as the, the router or the, the engine that's telling files where to go, where we can manipulate these things, and, and down the line. So as you can see, some of the ones, and again, we'll touch on these when we get into the product, but things like, you know, different file services, whether you're F SFTP, SCP, network shares, we can connect up to cloud services natively, your Amazon S3 buckets, Azure blob storage, and again, a couple examples like a database. Maybe it's something where you're getting a CSV file and you need to read that and put all the contents into a customer database. And vice versa, maybe you need to prepare files to send out to folks. So you actually do a SQL query into whatever database on the back end that you need to connect up to and take all those results in that SQL query and put it into a CSV or an Excel file and send it out the door. Everything that we do within Go Anywhere is audited and, and logged. Uh, this is definitely very, very important, especially when we get to a lot of the compliance regulations. Uh, access control as well as auditing and accountability are two huge factors with auditors. Auditors definitely want to know that you know what's going on with your files at any given point in time. We will do auditing from a file perspective, from all the listening perspective protocols, as well as we're gonna be auditing the gatekeepers, meaning we're gonna have audit logs of all the administrative use that's going on with the system. All this detailed auditing, we can generate custom reports. We do have 24 built-in reports to generate, as well as doing alerting, which is very common. You can do all the auditing in the world, but if no one's paying attention to them, it's kind of a moot point. Uh, alerting from simple things from a sysadmin perspective, maybe the service goes offline. You want to know, obviously, when that happens. Or if maybe connecting up to a partner's SFTP server fails, or that file transfer that you have an SLA tied to fails, you're going to want to know that that happens when it happens. So we can have that automated email alerting built right in. All right, let's move on. Look at a couple more enterprise features, and we'll jump right into the product. Again, as we mentioned, this is multi-platform. It is a Java-based application, so it really doesn't get its hooks into the OS. We're not dependent upon a lot of the uh, system services within the OSs, so we can put this on Windows, Linux, IBM, Novell, AIX, pretty much any operating system. We do control some of that batch and ad hoc transfers, which we'll look at when you jump in the product here. Auditing, again, very detailed audits throughout the product. Again, this gets that auditing and accountability. We can manage this entire interface, which we'll see here when we jump in, straight from a web browser, whether you're using Chrome, Firefox, IE, Opera, whatever it is that you guys want to use. What's important is no desktop client is needed. So we don't have to maintain any other client software within your organization. On the inbound services, again, we'll look at some of the server side things, but from all your FTP flavors to a web listener, AS2, and I think it's worth mentioning we are Drummond certified in the case that you are required to do a lot of your EDI transmissions using the AS2 protocol. Uh, encryption, obviously very important, especially when dealing with compliance. We talk about the in motion by the inbound services and the protocols protecting those. But we also have at rest encryption, uh, some inherently by some of the services we offer, but we also have encrypted folders to where we can target folders that you choose to do AES 256-bit encryption, which, by the way, is NIST approved, and FIPS, or Federal Information Processing Standards 140-2 validated. So we can have both the in-transfer and at-rest encryption within Go Anywhere, or end-to-end -end encryption. All this encryption, you'll notice we do have a key management system, a full-blown key management system within the product, and this is where we can manage SSL certificates, SSH keys, as well as PGP keys whether you wanna create them straight from Go Anywhere, or if you already have some available, you can import them in to leverage within Go Anywhere. And when we look at admin controls, we do have 16 different RBAC roles, and this provides for job separation of duty or least privilege, so that you're only given rights to certain admins to what they need. Again, this is another big one on access control for your auditors to show them that you're just not throwing blanket admins at the product. But even so, we talked about the administrative logs, logging everything that your administrators are doing. A couple of cool things also as well, uh, private cloud, meaning we can keep a lot of these things on-prem. 
when we talk about that ex specific example, like your box or box.com and people doing collaboration, one of the features we'll kind of touch on, GoDrive, we can have those things on your private network. And by the way, those are by default AES 256 bit encrypted at rest. Our customer portal, which we'll take a look at, is our web portal. You can customize this with our web client brands to make it and give that look and feel that it is your branding site, as well as maybe any disclaimer statements that you want to do. Secure mail, a nice way to uh, be able to send out sensitive information using secure mail. We'll dip into that a little bit. Two-factor authentication, uh, we can do that from either certificates, SSH keys, as well as using RADIUS technology for any kind of web logins. Uh, the DMZ gateway here, uh, this is going to be a software-based solution. Uh, one way that we can make further protections from the outside world uh, to the internal network. A couple key things about the gateway that I would like to point out. Um, again, is software-based, but would, it re uh, doesn't require any files to be staged in that DMZ or any credentials. So kind of getting away from the traditional FTP type resources being staged in your DMZ. Uh, now we're eliminating that. We're pushing everything back into your private network, so keep everything back there. All the while, the second important point is no inbound ports are needed from that DMZ layer into your private network. And real quick, the way that we do that is MFT will open up a control channel from your private network. An outbound port will need to be open out to the DMZ. So going where MFT will tell the DMZ, say, hey, here's your IPs, your port mappings, basically all its proxy information. So that when someone does come in from the outside, and we'll say on port 22 SFTP, the way that it checks the credentials is it goes over that pre-existing control channel that was established uh, to give the gateway all its uh, proxy information. And they'll say, hey, I've got uh, John Smith here. He's coming in on 22. Here's his username, password, SSH key, or combination of both, whatever it is. If that's the case, it'll open up a separate channel, again, another outbound channel from MFT to private network out to the DMZ, and that will glue or broker that connection. So again, we're gonna stream all that information right through that gateway, nothing being staged, and not increasing that threat vector by having to open up inbound ports into your private network. So that's kind of nice there. Another thing that we'll talk about is clustering. From a high availability standpoint, it's nice we can do any kind of horizontal scaling. Uh, we can have more than you know two or more instances of Go Anywhere. Uh, that'll be part of a cluster. And the gateway, by the way, not only is it a forward and reverse proxy, but it can also do inherent load balancing between the two instances. So having an active-active cluster, this will give you more of that 99.999% um, uptime, as well as you know you can have your active-passive or your traditional. Um, disaster recovery should you want to put another instance maybe in a geographic different location. Okay. All right, so for the live demo here, let's go ahead and jump out of here and let's share my screen. Okay, and hopefully you guys can see the Go Anywhere Managed File Transfer web page. Brooke, if you want to give me a little confirmation there before I keep going. We can see it looks good. All right, great. Okay, so as mentioned, uh, it is browser-based uh, towards the where you can administer the product. So for instance, we'll say we downloaded this, and by the way, the install takes less than five minutes. Um, it's a quick next, next, next. You decide what directory you want to install it on. There's some default ports that you can choose during install, but you can always configure those later. So in this case, I'm installing this IP address. The default port 8000 is what I'm going to be using to for the admin server. Uh, again, I'm going to be using Chrome throughout this webinar, but you can use IE, Firefox, Opera, whatever you guys feel most comfortable with. I'm going to go ahead and log in here with my admin credentials. I can't speak and do this at the same time. There we go. Okay, so the first thing you're going to notice here is we've got a dashboard. Every single administrator that logs in will have his own My Dashboard, as you can see here. Uh, this dashboard is completely configurable up to you. You can choose one of five or one of 25 different gadgets to put on your dashboard, whether you're looking for maybe file transfer summaries or recently blacklisted IP addresses, secure mail usage, whatever the gadget is, you can throw it on there. And then once you put them on here, you can kind of move them around if you want. And then you can also actually edit the actual individual gadgets by hitting the little hamburger icon here. 
clicking on edit, and then maybe adding or taking away certain things within that actual individual gadget. All right, so let's take a look here. This quick links is a pretty popular one, especially for folks who haven't been exposed to go anywhere. And we'll kind of go through each one of these quickly and then jump through some projects and some more uh, live demo um, so you guys get a better feel of what go anywhere capabilities are. Uh, what, first thing we're gonna look at here is the resources. Now resources here are a way to define, again, the connection information to other servers and services that go anywhere can leverage. So this is where GoAnywhere can act as a client to connect out to other servers like say FTP or SFTP, maybe even databases, uh, whether they're in your organization or maybe defined at trading partner sites. Now these resources can contain things like usernames, passwords, IP addresses, anything needed to make that successful connection. Now once your resources are properly defined, now we can leverage those for use and reuse throughout, product, throughout the product and specifically within projects. Speaking of projects here, now this is our workflow definition. Again, belittling, but kind of your comparison to script files. At a high level, this is where you want to specify what you want to do with your data or define business processes. This is where all the workflow pieces and tasks are defined to move, store, manipulate data, and meet your business requirements. All projects can be initi initiated in a multitude of ways. They can be interactively run, meaning when I'm in there, just hit the execute button or by an admin, or they can be automated. Now, some of those automated mechanisms are schedulers, monitors, and triggers. Let's move on down. Those built-in schedulers you can use, and that you can use that we have here, or you can use your own enterprise schedule like Robot, Cisco Title, Windows Scheduler, or any other program that you're familiar with. You can define holiday calendars and give conditionals on what to do if your job fails on a holiday, or even retry a job for a predetermined amount of time should it fail upon first run. On our triggers here, triggers are based off of web user action. And we haven't talked about web users, we'll get there in just a second. So for instance, when a web user uploads a file via secure folders or SFTP, you can kick off a project to manipulate said data and process as directed. Or maybe you just simply wanna send off an email to the appropriate personnel to notify them that a file is available for processing. Monitors, monitors, Monitors are monitoring the file system for data creation, modification, deletion, or even if just a file simply exists within a specified folder location to kick off a project, or again, maybe just send off an email. Okay, getting to the admin and web users, kind of a basic concept here. Your administrative users are gonna be the folks that, uh, or the users that are logging in just like I am right now. Um, I logged into the administrative console. This is where I'm gonna set up projects, resources, configure the product, do some installation, things like that. As mentioned earlier, there are 16 different RBAC roles, and this is for our job separation of duties and lease privilege. On the web user side of things, now web users are gonna be those folks that are gonna log in, and by the way, not to be a misnomer to our HTTPS web listener, Web users are gonna be any user that you define to connect up to go anywhere, whatever the service you're offering, whether it's FTP, FTPS, SFTP, or web, web listener. And we'll go a little bit more into web users here in just a little bit. Getting back here, we've got our audit logs. Go anywhere, again, mentions we audit all web user activity within the product as well as all file transfer and associated administrator activity. Uh, this is again, very, very critical to our audit and accountability um, security family that auditors most likely wanna know, do you know what's going on with your system at any given time? Reports, all these audit logs can then be used to generate PDF reports about system activity and usage. These can be generated automatically to the appropriate staff members who administer the system or to maybe even upper management for snapshot status of what's going on. Then a couple more things on jobs here are completed jobs, and auditing and on an individual project basis. Every single project that runs creates a unique job ID so you can always view the job details as needed. And then queued jobs, we have an enterprise grade job queue management system. This can allow for prioritization of jobs. So if you have maybe certain SLAs on jobs, you can set with high priority whereas other jobs may be normal or lower priority set. Okay. So let's jump into some of the functions of Go Anywhere. The first place I'm gonna start is I'm actually gonna to go to resources here. Uh, resources, again, very, very integral to Go Anywhere. This is where we're gonna one-time define how we're connecting up to certain resources. 
A uh, very common one, as you can see, we're not going to go through all of these, uh, but a very common one is going to be kind of your database servers. Uh, this is where we can define a certain database. So if we click on this, you'll see you'll put in a name, which is arbitrary, whatever you want to call it. We do load the most common 2.0 JDBC drivers. So you'll select the driver that you want to connect up to, whatever that may be. The JDBC URL, not usually the most intuitive thing on the planet, but either your DBA will give that to you, or you can always hit the little ellipsis here, go through and go through the wizard, and I believe it's an I-series, looking for the IP address, we'll just throw one in there. And then you can hit generate URL and it'll generate that for you. You'd hit select, I'm gonna cancel on this one, and then whatever username and password that has rights to connect up to this database. In any case, when you do get done filling out this information, every single resource will have this test button. And what this test button is gonna do uh, is one of, is gonna do a couple things. One, we're gonna test for that network connectivity to make sure that we can even get here, make sure the ports are open, all that good stuff. And two, we're gonna check for that uh, username credential should it be applicable. So in this case, everything connected up to, we get resource test successful, so that's obviously a good sign. So now we can leverage this production 400, which is connecting up to this IV or AS400 database in projects. And we'll see that in just a little bit. Again, a lot of different resources out here, kind of going down the line. Another popular one, we'll kind of jump to the SSH servers. Uh, in particular, SFTP seems to be one of the more popular FTP flavors that we see a lot of partners and customers dealing with. Here again, we're gonna put in some uh, simple information, host, port, username and password, should they be asking for that, or maybe an SSH key, or both, depending upon what the server that you're connecting up to is asking for. One thing that I will point out on some of these connection-oriented uh, um, resources, we wanna make sure that we go to that connection tab, and at least on the client side, do our due diligence to make sure that we have a reliable deliveries. In this case, we wanna look at those connection retry attempts. So for instance, if we want to avoid maybe those simple network hiccups, like a router reboot, or maybe even the server rebooted for OS maintenance, hopefully it comes back online during our retry attempts so that we can actually complete out that job as well as just auto res or resume where we left off that transfer. So in the case of large files, maybe a gig file and you got 500 meg into it, it would really kind of stink if you didn't have retries you broke the connection, you got 500 meg into it, and you're not doing this job until the next day. Well, here, if we do connection retries, we successfully re connect after a retry, we're not only gonna complete the job, but we're gonna, we're gonna resume where we left off transmitting that file. So a couple key things there. And again, always hit that test button, and this will let me know, okay, good, I was able to list out files, and everything was successful. Okay. Without going through all of these resources, I think you guys get the point. The point is this is where we're one time defining them. So think of it from a perspective of like when you were doing script files, maybe you had SFTP uh, scripts, FTP, FTPS, RoboCopy, whatever the case may be, those resources could have been used in tons of different scripts, scripts all throughout your network. So if something changed, an IP address, username, password, it could be an administrative nightmare going to hunt all those down. Here, you come to the resources area, you, chase at the re you change it at the resource level, and it'll trickle down, say this is being used in 100 different projects. You don't have to worry about where it's being used. It's gonna trickle down and change it for you. Okay, so now that we've got our resources defined, let's go ahead and go into our workflows and projects. And projects, again, this is where we're gonna be able to do a lot of our manipulation, uh, whether it's you know moving files, doing some data translation, whatever the case may be. I'm gonna start off with a straightforward example to kind of get us used to the uh, project designer window. So this one's going to be an SFTP put single file. So for here, we're gonna look at these here, the project designer window. This is where, again, I hate using the comparison of script files, but this is where we're gonna use the nice GUI interface here to build out a business process that we wanna function. In this case, we're just gonna do an SFTP put. So what we have in the project designer window, we've got four uh, windows here. We've got a component library, and this is gonna be where your, all your action items are. 
So we talked about data translation, whether you're reading in or writing out certain types of files, maybe dipping into a SQL database. In our case on this one, we're going to be going to the file transfer, SFTP, and put file. Uh, but a lot of these you'll see they're kind of grouped into common categories, but you can always come up here and just do a search. Let's say I want to do SFTP put, but I didn't know exactly where it was. Type that in there, and it'll give you a list of all the things SFTP. Okay, so once we've decided on an action we want to choose, we can just drag and drop it up into our project outline, or we can always double-click it, and it'll show up in the project outline as well. The project outline window is, is just that. This is going to outline in a graphical sense all the steps that we want to perform. Uh, it's going to go sequentially step by step. Once this one's successful, we're going to go on down to the next one. So this is just your, again, graphical way of looking at what the business function is going to be. Once we do drag in those items, whatever the case may be, this one being an SFTP put, this third window is going to be kind of our attribute or things that we need to define those certain actions we did put in the project outline. So this one being an SFTP task, first thing we would need to do is define, well, which SFTP server am I even connecting up to? So these things over here, this is going to be your attribute window. What's the source file? Where am I grabbing it? Where is it going? Things like that. And we'll walk through this project in just a second as well. The fourth window over here is going to be our variables window. And this is going to be either things that we have uh, defined, uh, we'll call project variables, which we don't have any project variables in here. Uh, we can show a project of that. Uh, we always have system variables available to you. Uh, some very common ones like your system job log, which we'll see in a second. Maybe you want that to be an attachment to an email when this project fails. So that whoever you send this to, whether it's a help desk staff member or whoever, or the actual developer who, who did this project, they will actually get that text file of what actually went wrong. And then there's things called output variables, and we'll take a peek at this. It's a very, very common theme within Go Anywhere. The output from one task will put into a placeholder or a variable, and it's usually invariably used as the input to a following task. And we'll kind of see how that plays out here. So let's look at this project outline here and kind of walk through this simple project. First thing you're going to notice is we've got a black P, a red M, and a blue T. Those are your three main items within a project. The black P is kind of your placeholder, um, which we'll look at how do we call projects, either a scheduler, monitor, trigger, uh, using our APIs, uh, whatever the case may be, we need to know what we're calling. So the project level is kind of your container or your placeholder of that business function. There are a few global variables you can set, log level, job queue, job name, things like that. But for the most part, this is just to know, hey, who am I calling or what function am I calling? Within each project, you can have multiple modules. You'll see those are delineated by those red M's. Uh, and those are just one of the action items that you can pull over there. And modules are going to be a grouping of tasks. So think of it as your common business function within the overall project. And now within each module, you can have multiple tasks. And again, those are going to be these individual items that we kind of went through briefly to kind of define what's going on. So let's look at this first one, and we'll just kind of walk through. The first thing we did is we grabbed that SFTP put task, and we just dragged it right up in there. And so the first thing we need to do is, okay, which SFTP server am I connecting up to? So we'll hit that drop down list. Now this list here is getting populated by the resources that we defined earlier. So if you've defined it, then we can go ahead and select it. Our put task, this one's doing just an individual file. So I'm just browsing out to a network share, which again is another resource. Grabbing this demo file.csv, and I'm going to put it in this destination of incoming directory. But you'll notice we're going to do a little renaming on the fly. We're going to call it orders, and then leverage one of our functional variables, current date. Speaking of those functional variables, I'm going to kind of give myself a little bit more real estate here. When you click inside these um, fields, you'll notice this variable button here. This will pull up our expression wizard. I'm using current date, but you can do things like concatenate or string, trim, uh, position of lots of different functions to do further manipulation, whether creating or parsing out information uh, from files. 
What's also cool is you'll notice if I hover over, it's going to give you documentation and even example of what they're expecting. So just more ways that you can manipulate those files. Here, just kind of illustrating the output variable section, and this is just saying process source file is variable. So any of the file or files, in this case I know it's a single file, I want to put that in a variable called source file. We'll notice that gets auto-created. I click this back, source file. So in fact, let's just change this so you can kind of see how that gets auto-created. And we'll call this processed file. So then we go to the next task. You'll notice now process file is up there. So for the archive task, which is really a copy task, so I just want to take that file, even though I'm going to SFTP it to my partner, I want to take a copy of the original and put it in an archive directory. Now, since I just changed that, let's go ahead and get rid of that, but to show that we can drag and drop those output variables and just throw it right on in there. So now we're taking the original file, copying to the archive directory, and then just so I don't process that file again, I'm going to follow it up with a delete task. And again, since we changed that, let's go ahead and delete that and drag that process file. So this task is connecting up to an SFTP server. It's grabbing an individual file. It's doing a little bit of renaming. It's doing a put statement. Once that's done, we're going to make a copy of the original file, put it in an archive directory, and then we're going to delete out that original file. Now, one thing that we didn't look at, you notice everything is sequential. Once this task is successful, it goes to this one, to this one, to this one. Now, we do notice at the module and task level, we do have an on error call. So by default, if this is not defined, it's just going to abort the project. And then we can see it in the job log, which not only generates there, but we can always go to completed jobs. In any case, we can also do what we call continue. So if there's an error, but you want to go ahead and continue, you can do that. You can do a set var. Maybe you want to set a variable to a certain value and then do some conditional statements on that to do further processing. Or in our case, we're doing a call module. Now let's call module here. We're just going to call error. So anything that goes wrong within this module, in this task, any of these three tasks, I'm going to call the errors module, which is here, which again was something that we can just drag up in there, call it errors. And now I'm just doing a simple email. I'm saying, hey, by the way, project, we're going to leverage a couple system variables with the error message being a system job log error, or sorry, system job error. And then we're also going to attach the system job log. And again, these things you can just drag and drop right on in there. So now that if anything goes wrong in here, we're going to call this. But we can also do it at the individual task level. So maybe I want to know specifically if the SFTP connection failed. Then at the SFTP server connection, I can also do an error, SFTP error. So if this specifically fails, I'm going to go here, basically do the same thing, except my message is going to be a little different. Your SFTP task failed in project, give the name, and then again, attach that system job log so they can take a look at that. Okay, so that's the basics of a project. Now, how do we call projects or run them? One, I can hit execute here, uh, but for the most part, what most people are going to do is either from a scheduler, a monitor, or a trigger. Um, I'm just going to really quick go to monitors. I'm not going to save that, just to kind of show that exact same project that we did, but just from a monitor perspective. So from a monitor perspective, this is where we're going to monitor out certain local or network folders, as well as you'll notice any FTP resources. Uh, also, another thing to note is the local network um, resources can also be Amazon S3 buckets, as well as Azure Blob Storage, something that was added just recently. In any case, we can select our folder that we're monitoring. We can give the event types whether it's created, modified, deleted, or if it just flat out exists. You can give it a pattern, wildcard pattern. If you're regex savvy, you can also use regular expression. This is going to say, hey, you know, how often during the day am I going to search? And then am I going to check every minute, every, you know, 15 seconds, every hour? You decide how often you want to pull that folder and what days to run. The key point is once you do get a hit, whether it's 1, 5, 10, 100 files, you're going to call a certain project. And let's say we're going to call that project we just looked at. The monitor is going to build out inherently a files variable that is going to be the list of files that it grabs depending upon your stipulations on here, your general and scheduled tasks. So let's say, for instance, um, let's go back to that project. 
and let's go to our SFTP put single file. Let's say this is being kicked off or called by that monitor. We're going to call the same SFTP server, but instead of a single file, now we're going to actually be dependent upon that monitor. So let's say that monitor ran every minute in the first five minutes, it didn't hit anything. This project doesn't get called, but the sixth minute, it grabs 12 files. So what we're going to do is we're going to pass in that files variable that we just briefly looked at that gets generated by that monitor. So this is going to pass in as a parameter all 12 of those files that it found. Now, obviously, we can't use destination direct or file. We need to use directory, and we'll just say incoming here. And this is a good use of the process source files variable. So we can take all those 12 files, put that in a placeholder, so that now that when we archive, we're going to archive not the source file, but we're going to archive that source files variable. So we're going to archive all 12 of those files. And again, not going to use a destination file, but a directory, and say archive. And then the delete task will be the same thing. And we could actually use, not to be confusing, we could use that placeholder or we could use the original file monitor of files. And this would delete out the original files. So a way that you can see how you can use monitors to just monitor certain folder locations to kick off projects. We also have schedulers. Again, we have a built-in scheduler here. Uh, you can define holiday calendars. Uh, this is just going through and defining what your actual holidays are throughout your company. Once those are defined, then we can go into our schedule, and let's say it's, you know, you're running this daily, and if you do have a holiday calendar, now you can decide if this actually falls on a day that's a holiday, do I want to skip it, maybe do it the day before, next business day, things like that. And then also kind of mentioned, maybe, and I see this commonly, I want to run this job if it fails for the next two hours every 20 minutes to hopefully further ensure that we get those projects um, kicked off, or those jobs actually kicked off. All right, last thing, kind of look at triggers here. Triggers are going to be solely based off of web users. Now remember that brief description of web users are going to be those users that are logging in to go anywhere to leverage any service that you're offering, whether it's SFTP, the HTTPS web client, whatever it may be. A very common trigger is going to be your upload successful. So in this case, the first trigger is upload successful, and we'll just say any service, any service you're offering, and very common we'll say, hey, I want to know when username equals, say, partner A, I'm just going to choose my username for demo purposes. So when a file is uploaded successfully by web user D. Freeman, I want to call a project. That's going to be your most flexible option. But maybe you just want to you know, copy a file somewhere or rename it, move it. Or a lot of people like to just send an email, say, hey, by the way, D. Freeman just dropped off a file. That'll let whoever's responsible for that to go out and process it and do some further processing. Now, not just file movement, but triggers have a lot of like sysadmin type functions. And I just point out kind of the account disabled. Maybe you have an SLA and you definitely want to know when that partner or that user account gets disabled because they need to get stuff out the door every single day. You can get an email notification let them know what happens so you guys can get on it ASAP. Okay, now on the quick server side of things here, I don't want to take too much time on this, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, we talked about the different services we can listen on, uh, whether SFTP or and we'll talk about the web client. Uh, we can definitely listen on a web client and offer a lot of different services. To kind of illustrate some of the different services, let me jump back into the web users and we'll pick on myself here. A uh, couple key things to point out. Um, we do have different ways the web users can be authenticated. Whether you want to create them just right into Go Anywhere uh, and use their password policy rules and things like that, the web user security settings, or you can always tie into any kind of directory service, whether it's Active Directory, which is pretty common. Uh, this is where you can tie and do different login methods to sync things that you're doing in Active Directory, depending upon you know what groups you're syncing up to, what distinguished name you're starting your search from. Uh, a lot of different specifics that you can do, but once you set that up, now you can manage your users within Active Directory or whatever your LDAP services are to suck those users in to go anywhere. With each user, by authentication, by which service, now we can decide, do we just want to do username and password, or do we want to do maybe certificate or SSH public key, or maybe some dual authentication here and there.
from the feature standpoint, this is where you're giving out the certain features. The horizontal boxes here is going to be all the different service listeners we're listening on, so you can individually give them rights to certain services. And then this vertical column here is going to be dependent upon the HTTPS web client, and we'll jump into that here in just a second. Take a look at the folders tab here. So once they do log in, uh, think of this if you're using even FileZilla or WinSCP, when you log in, you get a certain folder structure of what you have access to when you jump in. Same thing here. Um, one thing to note is everything is virtual. So you'll notice my home directory is pointing to default, which is just in the install directory. Uh, that can be changed if you just unclick it. But you'll notice here I've got just got a multitude of folders that really have nothing to do with any of the home directory. This is actually pointing to an Azure blob storage. This one's pointing to a Windows user share. This one's pointing to a Linux mount. This one's actually an Amazon S3 bucket. Point is, you determine physically where these are going, give them an alias so they can see the folders that they have access to once they log in. You can also do disk quotas, and probably most importantly, give the granular permissions on what they can do once they do log in. All right, so let me jump over to the web client. I'm going to switch gears on you here. And this is the HTTPS web client. I'm going to sign in with my user account. This is really, really awesome for, um, say, you have partners that maybe aren't, uh, oh, again, can't do the uh, typing at the same time. This is really useful for people that don't want to manage clients like a WinSCP or FileZilla. Maybe their partner they deal with doesn't even have an IT department or they just don't want to deal with it. Everybody knows how to go to a web page. Um, and that's an assumption, but um, most people do. Go to a web page, give a username, password, sign on. And in the case of secure folders, I'm going to give a secure folders kind of the high level web version of what an FTP client is. Uh, this is a very, very popular option uh, to give to those those kind of customers that, you know, they don't want to go through, there's not much of a learning curve. They just want to go to a web portal like this, sign in, have secure folders. You'll notice this folder structure, and I'm going to switch back to the admin interface just real quick. That's what this is here. So whoever the administrator is, which happened to be me, set up as far as folders, that's what I'm going to see when I log in. Whether I'm logging in via WinSCP and I've been given SFTP rights or HTTPS like you see here and using secure folders. So now this user can just take you know, this local computer here and let's just drag and it says, oh, I gotta get the whole picture in there. And you drag it over there and it even tells you just let go. And you can drop it into whatever folder you have access to. So again, you can lock down the permissions. Again, my account has all rights so you can see that I can move everything in any which way I want, but they can come here to either do uh, file drop-offs, and that's all they can do is upload, or if it's an outbound folder and stuff they need to pick up, all they have rights to is download. Obviously, everything is um, audited from an audit standpoint, which we'll kind of see here in a second, but this is a nice, easy way for people to securely, over that HTTPS protocol, transfer files to you. All right, the next feature here I kind of want to show Getting on top of or kind of uh, accumulating on that is GoDrive, a popular option for more of your file collaboration type features. Uh, this is everything secure folders is. You can do the drag and drop, but this gets more to um, this gets more to the hey, if I want to share a file out with somebody, or if we do do some sharing of folders, all the files within there. Now, when I make changes, I have revision history. Um, I've got a trash bin that I can restore files to. I can get email alerted when someone makes a, a change. Not only do we have this web client or the um, web client you're seeing here, but there's also an actual client, desktop client that you can have to where it'll actually map out. I don't think mine's connected right now. There we go. You see the little client down here to now, I'm gonna get mapped a local drive that looks local to me, this G drive here, and things are bi-directional. So if this employee's PDF, I delete that, let's go ahead and yes, we should see, let's go ahead and refresh this, that employee's PDF file is gone. In fact, we should be able to go to the trash bin, and there we go. Just deleted here, 1049 today. And you can always restore them, things like that. And you'll see that notification here. So kind of our on-prem. Uh, one thing quick to note as well before I move on, this Go Drive directory is on your internal network. And it's also AES-256-bit encrypted 
at rest on your network. Secure mail. Uh, secure mail is a really popular option as well. This is going to be where you guys can send out mail or sensitive information securely, thus the word secure mail. A uh, couple things to, to point out. One, size doesn't matter. Now I've got a little asterisk um, that I'm doing over here. Um, it is dependent upon your HTTPS listener. By default, we set it at a gig, but you can set that from a go anywhere or an HTTP protocol perspective. Doesn't really matter how large that is. Usually anything that you're going to run into limitation-wise will probably be from a browser perspective. So you can attach enormous files to secure mail. Um, the other cool thing is when you send secure mail, it goes to a central repository called a packages directory. That also is on your internal network, and that also is encrypted AES 256 bit encrypted. It will replace the entire email with a URL link that's going to come right back to what your HTTPS listener is and then append it with a 36 unique identifier that's gonna create a folder, put all those contents in to send out to your recipients. So that when they click on it, they can come back in, whether you're requiring a password or actually being a registered user on the system, that's how they come back in to your private network to download those contents. So it's kind of nice from a, if you're an exchange admin, now you don't have to worry about people accidentally trying to send a 100 meg attachment to the all distribution list and your exchange server one starts running like a dog and freaks out. And two, even if it did send, which it probably wouldn't because your send connectors are so much smaller than that, now you have information in 100 or 200 or 300 different mailboxes, send items, delete items, out all over the place. This keeps everything in a central repository especially from a sensitive information standpoint, uh, now you know and you have inventory of where everything is. Okay, last thing we're gonna look at here, let me kind of jump back to the deck here. And I wanna jump in real quick uh, on the latest feature that we do have is cloud connectors within 5.7. <clears throat> With those cloud connectors, Currently, we do have eight that are out of the box connectors you see here. We've got things like Salesforce, SharePoint, Dynamics 365, Box, Google Drive, Cloud Storage, as well as Dropbox. Um, now, along with these, you'll also have the ability to build in your own cloud connectors um, uh, within the designer. For now, though, we're just going to focus on the pre-built ones. Uh, to do this, we do have a marketplace accessible straight from Go Anywhere, Admin Portal, download and install the cloud connectors of choice. Um, in the interest of time, I think I'll just kind of jump right in there. Uh, this is just kind of showing a picture, so I'll just kind of do this within the, within the product here. So let's go ahead and jump right back in there. And first thing we'll do here is let's go back to the administrative interface. So again, these cloud connectors here um, are going to be under system and then cloud connectors. And let's not say that. So here you can see we've already added a few of them, but it's as simple as hitting the add cloud connector and this will pull up our marketplace. So these are eight of the ones that our development team have already predefined for you just to install as you see here. Uh, once you do hit the install button, which we'll do on Dropbox since we haven't done it, that's gonna go ahead and automatically pull it down. So you see it already popped in right here and it's gonna give you a 30, 30 day free trial similar to the Go Anywhere product itself. Uh, so here, once you do pull them down, you can kind of look at the information and see the different tasks that you now have natively built in. And this is going to be on the resources side, which we'll show in just a second. These are the things that now you can do when connecting up to Dropbox in this case. I'm going to go ahead and uninstall this one. And let's use box.com because uh, I do have one set up there so we can kind of show how this integrates right into here. So once we do the install, again, go to that marketplace, hit install, we've installed the box connector, it's there. We have to go to resources, go to our cloud connectors, hit add cloud connector, and then you'll see that box connector in here. I've already done one, so we'll kind of open up my box professional services one here. So we'll put in all our information. Once we do that, just like with every other resource, you do have a test button. And if it's successful, we're good to go. So now to integrate this into a project, we do the very similar things. So let's go to our cloud connectors, uh, Linoma portal box upload. So the first thing you notice is here, we've got a cloud connectors in the component library. 
So I'm going to go to the one that I created, which was the box connector here. And we've got, these are going to be our different tasks that we're able to do. For our simple project, I just chose a make directory, which we can drag and drop, and then an upload feature. For the make directory, we're going to call webinars are awesome. And then we're going to upload this looks like event items text. So we're going to throw it in that webinars are awesome spot. So just so you don't think I'm pulling the wool over your eyes, we don't have it there yet. So let's go ahead and go back to our project and let's go ahead and execute this. And hopefully we're successful. Drum roll. Awkward silence. And there we go. Okay. Whew. All right. So let's come back to box and hit refresh. And we should see our webinars are awesome. And then we should see our event items that text in there. So again, just ways now that we have integrated the uh, cloud services into Go Anywhere. Again, keep that central pane of glass, that central management. But one thing I really want to show real quick, and I'm not going to go into too much detail, all that looked real simple. We hit install, added a resource, and made two little um, component or uh, little tasks here to do what we just did. But let's look at the job log. Um, this is the stuff that our development team has done in the back end to make these things look as easy as what I just made them. There are tons of REST calls going on in the back end to do everything that we just did. So it's, it's um, I know it looked easy, but a lot of the stuff they did in the back, that's why this stuff is really, really cool. Um, now that was a super quick example. I just know on time-wise here, I want to give you guys some a chance for Q&A. I did have another example on Salesforce, but we'll kind of, in lieu of time, kind of skip over that. I'm just going to jump back here. And yeah, we'll kind of get there. So Brooke, if you want to... Yes, sir. I'll give you a chance to catch your breath, Dan. Uh, I wanted okay. to thank everyone um, before we take a few questions live, but thank you for joining us today. I did want to let you know that we do have the free 30-day trial, as Dan mentioned, on our website, where you can use all of the Go Anywhere features as well as the new cloud connectors. So check that out if you're interested. And then if you're already using the software, or maybe you're in a free trial already, um, you can upgrade to version 5.7 in the Go Anywhere integrator, and all you do is go to Help, Check for Updates. Super easy. So instructions on the screen there, and then our contact information, too, if you do have questions. Dan's email, I'm sure he'd love to answer your questions uh, via email. Um, our sales email as well as phone numbers. So um, we will uh, have a few minutes here for um, a couple questions live. I know we're close to the top of the hour. So if you'd like to drop off, go ahead. If you feel like you've gotten all the information you need, and we hope you have a great day. And then for those of you who do want to stay on for a couple more minutes, uh, if you have a question, you can submit it in the Q&A there, and we'll try to get to it in the next minute or two. Uh, Dan, we've had a couple questions come in. One I think you can address live for everybody. Uh, a couple people have asked on which operating system can you install Go Anywhere. Uh, specifically, Unix was asked about, uh, as well as AWS and Azure. So, um, can you clarify for that? Yeah, absolutely. So, again, we can install pretty much, we're, we're for the most part, agnostic. Um, Unix, AIX, Novell, Windows, Linux, all the different operating systems, um, but also out in um, Azure as well as AWS. Uh, in fact, in, in AWS, we do have a, a few pre-built uh, for Windows and Linux AMIs out there, and we are in the works, I believe. Um, well, I know we're in the works. I'm not sure if they're out there yet for Azure as well for some of the pre-built options. But yes, you can absolutely install Go Anywhere out in Azure or AWS. Perfect. And then we did have another one on uh, Apache patch and vulnerability, how we handle that with Go Anywhere. Is that something that's quick to address, Dan, or better to follow up one-on-one -on -one after? It is. I mean, being being a security conscious company, those are a lot of things that happen in the back end uh, when we do our version upgrades. Um, those are the things I think that are going to be more found if you go out to the release notes on the actual upgrades that we're doing for Apache as far as the versions and some of the security uh, fixes that we've done. Sounds good. All right. I think we've had a couple more questions come through. Um, if we haven't gotten to your question, we will follow up with you one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, and then we do have the survey at the end of the webinar. Feel free to enter additional questions in that as well, and we can get back to you. Um, but that's all we have time for today. I hope everyone found this to be helpful. And 
Um, thank you so much for joining us. We have a great rest. Hope you have a great rest of your day. And thank you, Dan, for um, everything that you've gone through today. Yeah, thanks, guys.